that I think what's really important now for students to think about and acknowledge is that actually your first impression nowadays is isn't at the interview obviously that was traditionally how you made your first impression whereas now that's happening more and more online so I think it is really important for them to think about and understand what their digital footprint is and what that particularly means so yeah I wanted to talk about that in a little bit this, uh, this afternoon as well. And Sarah, we recently ran a competition called Passion Flash, which invited students from uh, across the university to make a three minute video about a subject of their choice to help them develop their skills. And there were some great submissions in that, weren't there? There, there really were. I mean, that, that competition. So we ran it this year for the third time. It will be running again next year. And it's, it's, it's really a good way for students to kind of get that very first solid digital footprint, um, but also to build their communication skills. And as you know, Andy, we've got students that really, really enjoyed it this year and the years before. And um, it's a great thing that's coming out of the University of Salford. And Trevor, you've been so involved with doing science communication work over your career. But and it feels like I was just looking at your YouTube channel, which we'll show some bits of in a moment. But it's been a real presence in your life to be in the media doing activity. When did that really begin for you? Well, I, I got involved in public engagement in science or what used to be called science communication back in the 90s when I was kind of a, a newish lecturer. So I think 95 might be when I first started doing things. <laughs> Uh, and, and eventually it sort of kind of morphed to doing more and more stuff online and in media. And that's partly about reach, really. Uh, you know, you, you can go into schools, do some great things. And I, I've encouraged everyone to do stuff like that. But then you start thinking about how can I reach more people? And then obviously you start thinking about media. And, and nowadays, of course, social media and, and other ways of getting to them. And uh, looking at your YouTube channel, you've got videos that have reached over 150,000 views. It's something that seems like quite a constant presence in your life. But you've also done radio interviews and you've had your own series as well. Tell us about some of the things you've done recently and how that sort of helped you develop your career. I guess that I mean, the big development for me was uh, in media stuff was I uh, was an engineering and physical sciences research council senior media fellow. And that actually brought some of my time to develop the skills because it's a skill you have to learn. It's like any, you know, it's like playing a musical instrument or learning a language. It's it's something that I think most people could adapt to if they want to and learn. But it, it takes practice. And I, and I guess the first sort of media experience of, of sort of uh, being very heavily involved was just selling news stories where you, you know, we had a, a news story at the, at the uh, British Science Association Science Week about a duck quack not echoing and, and and that kind of thing and that was a big international news story so that was my first <laughs> sort of doing things like this of standing up and answering questions you know that people throw down the line at you uh, but then i got onto the other side of the mic if i could put it that way or the other side of the camera in presenting so i, I did i've done about 25 documentaries for radio 4 and they're great you, you put together a 30 minute piece about something you're passionate about in acoustics um and so i've done that i've also written two popular science books one called sonic wonderland the other one now you're talking which you know has been translated into multiple languages around the world uh, and then now i've got this new podcast the invented podcast that is launching today yeah speaking of which we're going to show a little bit of a trailer of this so let's have a look and see what it feels like to be part of this podcast the inventive podcast mixing engineering fact and fiction with trevor cox professor of acoustic engineering at the university of salford the idea is simple i interview an engineer we pass that conversation on to a writer and commission them to write an imagined story inspired by it the result fascinating engineering tales mixing fact and fiction my name is shrukalata engineer by day belly dancer by night there is a child sitting in the middle of the circuit board. A child formed in Egypt, but not of Egypt, not of anywhere. 24-7 refugee. Nice to meet you. That's inventive. <laughs> inventive. 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 Please subscribe to the Inventive Podcast wherever you get your podcasts. And we'd love you to like, comment and share. You can find us on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram and LinkedIn. Just search for The Inventive Podcast.
Wow. So that looks really exciting. So I think what's really great to have you here to talk about, Trevor, is just how how varied the sort of academic life can be. And I think understanding how you can begin that very early on in your career, I think is really useful for students to hear, because I guess when we started back in the 90s, there weren't sort of social media channels in which we could sort of build our skills, our voice, and also, I guess, develop our identity as well. And that's a big part of student life today, isn't it? Yeah, I think the great thing about podcasts, and I think the similar, it's similar is true for things like blogs or, or vlogging, is that there's a very low barrier to actually, you know, actually do it. We can all do it. We can, you know, set up a site tomorrow and start blogging. And and one of the nice things about that is it's it, because it's a low bar to get to get going. Is it allows you to experiment and, and get things mm. wrong sometimes and see, you know, write something that people say, you know, well, that wasn't very interesting, and because I don't write any comments, or write something interesting and see all the comments pull in, and you sort of kind of learn what people want from it. So I think there's nowadays social media opens up the opportunity to, to practice your communication. And in the past, that would have been, you know, standing on, the, going to a school and talking to people and, and, and learning that way, which is also, I would suggest, also very invaluable to talk face to face mm. to people as well. So there's nothing like talking to people and seeing how they react live to really understand whether you're really getting the message across. So there's tools out there for you to reach audiences which you couldn't reach normally. But of course, what's happened since then, we've lived through the whole era, haven't we, Andy, of it not being there. It being very easy to get an audience because there wasn't very much of it to it's overloaded. I mean, I can't remember the numbers of podcasts that are launched every day, but it's frightening if you've just launched one, I can tell you, because it's very, very large. <laughs> But then I guess it's also about a range of other things, isn't it? It's about trying to get more scientists, engineers, academics, researchers mindful of the importance of sharing what they do with the public. So even if your your blog or your podcast doesn't have hundreds of thousands of, of listeners or followers, which, of course, yours will. But nevertheless, if you don't, then it's still about that ecosystem of, of engagement with wider society. Yeah, and it could be there's a niche audience that you want to talk mm. to, which is small. Uh, I mean, I, I do work on accessibility and other issues where, you know, I, the audience will be small for what we're trying to do. But it's the audience who can really gain and, and will get, you know, give us research impact. So it's not always about you need to get on the mainstream television channels and reach the millions of people. There are times where you actually want to access a small audience who are, you know, who, and, and social media may be the only way or these sort of medias may be the only way of reaching them. And that's one of the great things about podcasting and doing things on YouTube and blogs is you can get that very bespoke audience, that sort of niche interest that you have. Sounds, sounds really fascinating, um, Trevor. So for, for in terms of students starting out, so um, within the biomedicine team and at Hands and actually university-wide, Andy mentioned we've got Salford Passion Flash. We've, got, we've had students within biomedicine who launched a magazine. Uh, but in terms of, you know, a, a student going ahead and perhaps starting a blog, would you say that, that that can be about any topic or should they align it to what they're studying? Um, and how might that, I suppose this might then uh, go off to Paula, how, how do we think, you know, what are the benefits to a, a potential employer if, if we can showcase this on our CV? If I if I I'll answer my my side first, I think yeah. the first of all is I think you've got to write about something you're passionate about, mm -hmm. and I think that's you know it's nothing worse than setting up a blog because you think it's worthy, and then you've got the oh I've got to write another blog this week and another one, and you're bored by it. I mean I've written books which take hundreds of hours to write. There's nothing wrong, you know. There's nothing worse than starting a book project and thinking I never wish I started this. So you know you've got to be passionate i think to start off with about what you're communicating uh, but i think the other thing that people often fall into the trap of is not thinking about the audience so who do you want to write to would be the other question who do you want to reach and it will be a very different thing depending on what you want to reach so inventive is meant to be a very broad brush trying to get people who aren't interested in engineering in, interested in engineering hence why we're doing this mix of fact and fiction is to try and get people who wouldn't traditionally tune into engineering structures with Richard Hammond or whatever it might be. So we're trying to reach out beyond the engineer audience. Um, and if that's your desire, then that influences what you actually write. So I think thinking about audiences can be really important as well. Yeah, and just like, touching on what you've just mentioned there as well, Sarah, you know, anything that you can run, you know, out into, whether that's social media or generally on, on the internet platforms, whatever data is going out there about yourself, obviously you want it to be positive. You want when employers are, you know, recruiting and looking and, and seeing what you've done out there, 
anything that you can put on that sort of creates a professional image of yourself that shows that you you know you've done um a great piece of communicating sort of backing up your communication skills your language all that type of stuff is all going to come across as, as a really positive message to different employers so i think you know as you say starting a, a blog at this time or some students now are doing um promotional videos so particularly for LinkedIn actually that's something that you can put on onto your LinkedIn page now a few minutes talking about yourself and explaining who you are almost like a bit of a virtual CV we're seeing more and more those types of things that are, are coming in and in even some companies are asking for virtual resumes so there is a, a big shift I think recently in in the use of social media particularly and it's it's really important that students are using that professionally and and using it in a way that's going to promote and sell them themselves yeah definitely and I um and my son is just about to start secondary school so we visited some schools before lockdown all began and um and one of the headmasters at one of the prospective schools he gave a speech and he said the most important subject at the school today is drama because being a performer is such a central part of being able to communicate your skills being able to show your capabilities and I think the aspect of of being present is is a, such increasing pressure. You hear about prospective employers, you know, well, Google prospective <laughs> employees in, in the course of that selection process. So becoming comfortable with that is a really, like you said, Trevor, it's, it's a journey towards being comfortable. And it's not always a quick one, is it? I think you've also got to think that some people won't want to take all that journey. I mean, you know, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I just did a, a, an interview this morning uh, on something else and you know do you want to be stuck down the line trying to do a live te radio or television interview uh, knowing that a lot of people are watching and, and for some people that would completely freak them out uh, uh, but maybe some more thoughtful written pieces are something that you know would fit into what you feel comfortable doing so I think what I, I suppose I had if I think about my journey is I had this sort of kind of desire to do it but also the willingness to fail a few times as I do it and not, that not put me off um, but there are some people who, you know, would be frightened by the prospect and, and may find that sort of journey harder. But look at what communications you can do. And, and learning to present is actually really important because you'll do that loads of times, not only in your in your undergraduate degree or your postgraduate degree, but also as part of jobs. So being able to do it, maybe not to a big audience, but in front of a small audience is really important. Definitely. Yeah. And the, and, sorry, sorry, Paula. Um, yeah. the you know things like writing a blog or you know magazine article that sort of thing i think you know from, from in terms of transferable skills your your potential employer might want you to do those exact things but also they may want you to write reports and um summary documents uh, so again the skills are highly highly transferable and i think it's it is really important to to see those skills isn't it and employers to be able to to see that you've got that and that evidence and it's the other side i think as well with social media about when you think of your, your most common platforms that people use so you know your facebook linkedin twitter that type of thing it's actually understanding how you're going to use that platform and thinking about every bit of data that's out there about yourself an employer potentially could view that and search it and it's not just you know, posts that you might put on Facebook, for example, but it could be if you've reviewed something. Um, and it's actually thinking about the content that you're writing. So not just now, but in historically, if you were to Google yourself, and we, in a lot of our sessions, will encourage students to go away and do that because some people have never done it and see what comes up because your name will come up and there'll be all this information about yourself that you need to start thinking, is this professional and is it painting me in that professional manner? And, or if there's not, you know, what steps can you take to, to maybe remove some negative content? But there is, you know, it's definitely worthwhile doing that process now because even if you're sort of level four or whether you're coming up to the end of your degree, it's just going to increase, you know, over time, employers are just going to continually search and, you know, and sort of find out information about you. Definitely. So, Trevor, your podcast, is it officially launching this week or has it been out for a little bit? It's literally today because it's, um, <laughs> we've got, the first episode was with Shruk Alata, who you saw, he was the refugee LGBT campaigner, also electrical engineer. 
Uh, and so it's International Women in Engineering Day. So we thought it was an appropriate day to launch today. I mean, this is an interesting one, you know, talking to a friendly audience. When you're looking at these things, you're looking for publicity opportunities. So yeah. the day of something is a useful publicity. So it isn't coincidence uh, <laughs> that we're launching on International Women's Day with a brilliant women en a woman engineer. Um, so, yeah, it's literally uh, live today on, on inventivepodcast.com. That's another skill you need to learn is to drop URLs into things at, at, without it sounding odd. <laughs> oh, thank you, Andy. That's even better. There we go. And uh, I believe you also have an event coming up soon as part of Edinburgh Science Festival in five days. Is that that's right, isn't it, Trevor? Got yeah, right? we've, got, we've got two events. Actually, if you find the episode on Inventive Podcast, you'll see them. One of which is meeting three of our engineers um and uh, another one is actually meeting writers and engineers because what we do in, in inventive which i think is fascinating is we get these fiction writers to write stories inspired by the engineers because essentially engineers are not very good at telling their story so we're trying <laughs> to find new ways of getting engineering to a broader audience and uh, the one with shrooks is by tanya hirschman it's a, it's a real poetic piece of writing which i can't describe and give any justice to but i would recommend listening to and I know this will resonate with Sarah because we have a bio art society as part of the Hands uh, Directorate. And so we, we're really keen to explore the relationships between science and creative arts because it's, it's such an enriching part of our life, I think, but also brings those opportunities to expand what we do and reach new people. So, so thank you so much for being here, Trevor, and joining us at very short notice. And we wish you a lot of luck with the podcast. And of course, we'll share it far and wide and, and listen to it, of course, as well. So thank you again. Okay, uh, thank you. Take okay. care, Andy. And, uh, Take care. Bye-bye, Trevor. Thank you, Trevor. All right, so that was great, wasn't it? What a surprise, Andy. <laughs> <laughs> I know, it's uh, certainly when I joined Salford, I mean, Trevor has been in the sort of science communication game for a long time. and One of the early people that worked with the, the Fame Lab competition and did really well with that and, and then worked with Manchester Science Festival. So for a long time in Salford, he's been really, I think, driving things forward in terms of our science communication activity, but also just showing how it goes far beyond just you know making your own content. It's working with artists, with creators, with writers, and a whole range of people that can tell your story as a scientist. And I think that's that's often something that really just enriches our lives in ways that's quite uh, enjoyable and expands our own potential as well. I've got a good friend that's been working a lot on the COVID science and he's recently released his first novel. And I think that's, you know, that's aspect of the of the academic life that we, we need to talk about as well. Absolutely. Um, and I think it is, it's something that the university is incredibly good at. And I think our students are very good at as well. Um, so, you know, I think we're only going to get bit bigger and better at this sort of thing. Definitely. And uh, we were hoping that uh, Catherine Beechel, our social media manager at the university, could join us today, but unfortunately had a conflict in her calendar. But she mentioned to me yesterday that the approach from the university's perspective when creating content is to think about content as being TikTok first. And if you understand that platform, you'll understand why that's important. And it takes a while to get used to and feel, feel comfortable with making that sort of content, but it's certainly driving a lot of engagement in other platforms too. So it's worth thinking about how you establish your professional identity as a student. I think partly, Paula, to make sure that those, when your employers do sort of see what you're all about, you can show them a fantastic LinkedIn profile. You can show that you're engaged with your subject. Those are all great things to do, aren't they? Oh, definitely, yeah. And I, th I think like we just touched on before, it is that shift now from just having that paper-based CV to actually just having all that online content. And people are using and being a lot more creative nowadays with the way that they actually sell themselves. And they're using things like QR codes now on a CV, linking to a platform and, um, you know, having their own websites where it showcases the portfolio of the work they've done or projects they've been involved with. And actually, I think that's a fantastic way of being able to showcase your skills um, to an employer and they're actually seeing not just your, your technical skills and your ability but those wider transferable skills as well. <laughs> 